Good morning. Uh, wish you could see your smiling faces. Uh, it's beautiful out there today. I'm doing this on Saturday, so it's beautiful today. It's probably going to be beautiful tomorrow, uh, which leads me to something that uh, we're going to start drive-through services tomorrow. Uh, we're going to have a nine o'clock drive-in service. Uh, kind of like a car drive-in from the 1950s, you know, or Sonic, where you go in and sit there. And uh, uh, when you do that, if you come, uh, bring your own chairs. You could sit outside if you want and listen to it on the radio, or uh, we'll have the radio going. We'll be doing it from in the church, and then you could be listening outside. So uh, we're going to be doing that for a while, as long as this coronavirus stuff is still upon us. But if you're listening to this, and obviously you aren't there, then, uh, you know, that's, that's something that we can be doing. I want to start off with a verse, uh, Jonah 3.10. If you haven't had the chance to read Jonah, uh, it's only four books, and it is a fascinating book in the Old Testament. There's more than him getting eaten by the whale. In fact, I kind of like the stories at the end a little bit better. Uh, it gives a little bit more meaning, but uh, this one is Jonah 3.10. Uh, and if uh, we're going to start with communion meditation and then we'll have Pastor Bill. So if you are wanting to get uh, a piece of bread and uh, something to drink to take communion, now would be a good time. So Jonah 310. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. So now for the meditation. Memorial Day is the holiday for mourning our veterans, and I've given some World War II veteran stories for meditations. However, none like this one. Japanese airman Nabu Fujita is the only pilot to bomb American soil. On April 18, 1942, Doolittle's Raiders, an elite U.S. bombing unit, damaged the heavily secured Yokosuka Naval Arsenal. Vowing revenge, three months later, the Japanese created a plan to attack the U.S. mainland. The reconnaissance Japanese submarines on the west coast of the United States had been fitted with a short runway and a small bomber. Naboo's sub had been patrolling Washington and Oregon. Once they had launched an attack on an old Civil War fort, thinking it was an active base. Imagine Nobu's surprise when the emperor's brother and a commander showed up to personally give him orders to attack Oregon's forests. The goal was to start a massive forest fire which could destroy thousands of forests, towns, and create massive civilian casualties with only a couple of bombs. Nobu carried out his orders. He dropped two bombs at the base of Mount Emily. A Forest Service fire looked at saw a Forest Service fire scout lookout saw smoke and firemen put out the fire. Three weeks later, Nobu tried another location of forest and it again failed. It made the papers, but didn't generate much interest. In 1960, Brookings, Oregon, the closest town to the, uh, to the incident, was looking for something that could distinguish their small town from others. In their archives, they found the bombing incident. In 1962, at the 23rd annual Brookings Azalea Festival, Nobu Fujita was made their guest of honor. He was in the parade, honored at the Crab Fest, got to attend a church service, and got to fly over the bomb site. Touched, Nobu gave his family's 400-year-old samurai sword to the people of Brookings, where it remains today. He visited Brookings many more times and was named an honorary citizen of Brookings, Oregon. His daughter spread some of his ashes on Mount Emily and said he felt his soul would forever be flying over this forest. Anger and hatred are destructive forces, but in the end, they never amount to much good. Peace, love, forgiveness lead to a much more progressive result, which can be more, far more lasting. Nobu Fujita's bombing lasted a day. His friendship with a town lasted more than a generation. Jesus said in Luke 35, 36, But love your enemies, do good to them, and lend them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great, and you will be great, and you will be children of the Most High, because he is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. 
Jesus demonstrated that on the cross. He asked God to forgive them. Every time we sin or act out of anger, it's like uh, we're no boo dropping bombs in Oregon's forests. Luckily, his sacrifice on the cross is putting out those fires, turning them into something meaningless. We owe Jesus a lot, considering as human beings we tend to be self-destructive. We need to make sure we ask for forgiveness and we forgive others around us. The blood is the wine, the bread is the body, and his sacrifice forgives us all. Lord, thank you for the opportunity to be here, and may we take these blessings and remember you with all our heart. Amen. My fellow Americans, Memorial Day is a day of ceremonies and speeches. Throughout America today, we honor the dead of our wars. We recall their valor and their sacrifices. We remember they gave their lives so that others might live. The unknown soldier who has returned to us today and whom we lay to rest is symbolic of all our missing sons. About him we may well wonder as others have. Did he marry? Did he have children? Did he look expectantly to return to a bride? We'll never know the answers to these questions about his life. We do know, though, why he died. He saw the horrors of war, but bravely faced them. Certain his own cause and his country's cause was a noble one, that he was fighting for human dignity, for free men everywhere. Let us, if we must, debate the lessons learned at some other time. Today, we simply say with pride, thank you, dear son. May God cradle you in his loving arms. Good morning, and welcome to Virgie Christian Church, uh, those that are listening and are online. Um, we just thank you for the ability to uh, be in your home today. Uh, I do want to just stop and read you a story. This is from Scott Jensen. Now, I, I have a tendency of reading pastor sermons, not necessarily for their sermon content, but just for illustrations. And I love the story that he gave back in June uh, 2010 for Memorial Day. It's 3 a.m. on a cold winter day. Patchy snow covers the landscape as loudspeakers overhead blare, blaring, telling everyone to get to their places. Surrounded by sandbags, concrete barriers, roughly 10,000 soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines at Begum Air Force Base has flipped a switch and turned from a deployed city in sleep to a sea of green and tan military waiting for their direction. Some just woken from a few moments of sleep, others leaving their duties to attend to more pressing concerns, all focused on the events that they are about to unfold. Down the three-mile main road of this Afghanistan base, standing shoulder to shoulder, men and women in arms, awaiting to pay their respects to their fallen comrade. Soon the lights of emergency vehicles could be seen slowly making their way up the boulevard. Escorts leading a flatbed trailer to an awaiting C-17 cargo plane on its way back to the United States. On the trailer are three caskets draped in United States flags. And the trailer approaches the lines of, uh, of servicemen lining the streets, each paying their respects by saluting sharply the men and women who have paid the ultimate price. Once the trailer reaches the plane, the formation is dismissed. Thousands of servicemen in the middle of a war zone paying homage and respect the best way they know how. Similar ceremonies are played out in other parts of the world, all to show love, respect 
for the sacrifices and dedication of our and duty of our military servicemen and women to show on a daily basis. Memorial Day is about remembering these fallen heroes. Um, today is a day that, or this weekend, we stop uh, in the midst of our cookouts and our family time and uh, enjoying the weather to just remember all those who have paid the ultimate price, the ultimate sacrifice for their country, starting all the way back in the Revolutionary War, all the way to today's events. And we honor those men and women who have gone before us in service to this country, and we thank them. And we need to stop and not only to remember them at this time, but also the families that now uh, no longer have their son or daughter, husband, wife, child, dad, grandfather. We need to just stop and remember what they have done for us and continue to pray diligently for all those who serve continuously that we have the ability and the right to worship God in any way that we see fit at any time we see fit without the worry of, of getting uh, jailed or, or anything else. So let's just take a moment for that. I'm going to pray and then we're going to jump into our service. Dear Father, we do thank you for those men and women who from a very early age will take up arms to defend this country and her freedoms. Father, we thank you for those that have gone in harm's way for people they don't know just to defend our flag and our freedom here that we may worship you and praise you and give you glory and honor. Father, we praise you for all that you do, and we pray at this time especially that you would be with the families of those left behind, of those who have paid the ultimate sacrifice, of those who did not come home. Father, we pray for those that still mourn, wondering what their child would have become, would have done, would they have married, would they have had kids. Father, we pray that you would just bless them. Uh, with comfort and peace. Father, we praise you for your everlasting love and everlasting mercy that we can come before your throne because of the ultimate sacrifice that Jesus paid for us. We praise you, we love you, and we thank you for all things, great and small. And we ask this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. So we are on to Memorial Day, but we're also on to day three of our Beatitude study. Do you guys remember the Beatitudes that have come before us? Have you been studying the Beatitudes that have come before? Uh, I hope you have. I hope you're just uh, trying to memorize them, which is a, a great thing. Um, remember uh, Matthew 5 is where the Beatitudes start. Uh, verse 1, seeing the crowd, Jesus went up on the mountains. His disciples came to him. When he sat down, he opened his mouth and began speaking. And it says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the gentle or meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness sake, for they shall be satisfied. That brings us to verse 7. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Now, I want you to stop and think for a moment. In your mind, uh, what does mercy mean? What does it mean to be merciful? If you look up the definition of mercy, it is to have compassion, to pardon, and to forgive. So, uh, you know, I have to be honest and say, you know, a lot of times I hear, oh, you know, we receive mercy. I think of just that, you know, somebody's being nice to me or, or kind of uh, just allowing me to do things. Um, Father, uh, we, uh, we have a tendency of forgetting the very important part of this, which is forgiveness, pardon. Um, in one of my commentaries, it's this one, it's uh, Mastering the New Testament by uh, Myron Augsburger. He writes this, and I think it's a great, great way to think of it. This beatitude calls us to the most exacting self-examination. 
Perhaps we need to examine our motives in religious exercises more than any other area. How easy it is to cover selfish ambition with the cloak of a righteous service. Well, I did this for you because Jesus told me to. Now pat my back. Although the sermon Jesus raises the issues of motive, asking that we serve not for the praise of men, not for the conventional respectability, but with the integrity of heart. It has been said that in religious service, there are three temptations. Now listen to these because I, I really like these. The first temptation is the temptation to shine. The second temptation is to whine. And the third temptation is to recline. Where are you at right now in your religious service, in your beatitude study? Where are you currently at? Are you able to pardon, to forgive those that have hurt you? Now, sometimes we, we may be able to forgive a, a lesser evil than another, but sometimes those evils are just so deep inside of us that we cannot forgive. We cannot just we want almost evil to happen to them like they have been evil to us. Very seldom do we see the greatness of mercy until we stop and realize the mercy that has been given us. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. If we are not merciful, I wonder what does that do for us not only it steals our life here it steals our ability to be in service for the king um, but we show a very poor image of jesus to others if we are unwilling to forgive and we boast about our christianity first temptation to shine then what are we portraying jesus to be I want you to ponder that as we go through that today. You know, one of the things that came up to me is, is one of my favorite movies is Braveheart. I, I love the history behind it. I love the stories. Now, if you really research William Wallace, uh, some of it is true. Some of it is more legend and fictitious. Uh, they believe that William Wallace was a real uh, Scottish knight uh, back in the day. Uh, William Right, uh, Wallace was about a six foot seven giant. So I want you to picture right now, and I, I tried to superimpose Chip's face on this picture, but I couldn't figure out how to do it. But I want you to picture somebody really big, six foot seven. His sword was five foot four that he used. That is bigger than most kids and some adults I know. It is a massive sword, and it's actually on display in the Wallace mo uh, Monument in Scotland right now. Um, but through the movie, we see that, you know, William uh, tried to do what was right, and just there was a lot of injustices done to him. So he took it upon himself to become justice, to uh, spark a rebellion, to get away from evil rule. And, and I won't go into too much more about the movie, but at the very end of the movie, one of the very few movies you ever watch, and again, I believe it's historically somewhat accurate anyways, at the end of the movie, spoiler alert, William Wallace is caught, William Wallace is martyred in a most horrific way, um, but what I find interesting is at the end of the movie when he is, uh, and I was going to show a video and I figured it was not uh, PG uh, rated, um, was at first the people were screaming, kill him. And then they saw the excruciating things that they were actually doing to William Wallace. And the crowd began yelling, mercy. In fact, the, I believe it was a priest that was doing the, the deed of killing William Wallace to purify him. Um, and he leaned over and he kept saying, just say mercy. And William Wallace, being strong, did not. He said, I'm not going to ask for mercy because then that would negate everything I've done. So there is a, a dichotomy, a, a split here of looking at the people originally yelling, kill him. 
now we're yelling, just be done, give him mercy, show him pardon, forgive him already. If you're, if you're going to do this, he's, but just do it quickly, if you will. Uh, stop doing it so excruciating. So in that, how often do we look at someone who has hurt us, and even if one side of our mouth says mercy, we say just do it quickly. We, just, we still want things to get done, and, and we're not truly giving mercy. Mercy means forgiveness, compassion. Are we showing mercy and compassion to absolutely all those who we see. Luke 10, 25, I want you to look at this, uh, and I'm sure you've all heard it before. We're just, I'm going to read through it, and then we're going to go over it. And a lawyer stood up and put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall we do to inherit eternal life? And he said to him, What is written in the law, and how do you read it? And he answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, as your na- and love your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have answered correctly, do this and you will live. But wishing to justify himself, he said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among robbers. And they stripped him, beat him, and they left him half dead. And by chance, a priest was going down that same road. He saw him. He passed on the other side. Likewise, a Levi also saw him and came to that place, saw him and passed to him on the other side. But A Samaritan who was on a journey came upon him, and when he saw him, he felt compassion. And he came to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring oil and wine on them, and he put them he put him on his own beast and brought him to an inn, took care of him. On the other day he took uh, on the next day, he took out two denarii, which a denarii was a full day's wage. So whatever you made uh, Monday, you're going to give that to take care of this man that you don't even know. Um, gave the denarii to the, to the innkeeper and said, take care of him and whatever you, you more you spend, I will return and I will pay you. Which of these three do you prove to be a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? And he said, the one who showed mercy toward him, Jesus said, go and do the same. Now you can look at this and go, wow, that's a great story about the Samaritan. I need you to understand, Samaritans hated, people from Samaria hated Jews. Jews hated Samaritans. Why? Because they were kind of the same people, but then the Samaritans got kind of taken away and they became half-breeds. They became so incorporated with others and, and the other religions, even though the Jewish people had often done that too in the Old Testament, we see, but they hated each other. And there became a war as to where will Jesus be and where will he come back and just silliness, typical human silliness. So when you see that he showed him mercy, here is a man that despised the man that was laying there. He despised who he was. And yet he could not go past without helping. Sadly enough, the two religious people, the the priest and the Levi, walked right past him and, and didn't even didn't even stop to say, are you okay? They, they actually went out of their way to walk around them. So I ask you this, church, are you showing compassion to those you can't stand? And why can't you stand them? If we're called to love, if we're called to be a, a, a priestly nation, if we're called to give the gospel to others, our actions speak far louder than any word we will ever say. When we see someone who's down and out and we pass by him because we don't want to be bothered or we don't want to get bloody or, you know, I don't have time for you. It's the exact time that we have forgotten what Jesus called us to do, which is to be his hands and feet on this earth. If we cannot show mercy, then we have lost who we are to be in Jesus. Jesus said, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Now, I want you to stop and think about that. How have you received mercy? Well, let me ask you this question. Have you ever sinned? 
I'll, I'll give you a minute. Go ahead and think about that. It shouldn't take you too long. Yes, you have. Everyone who's watching this, everyone who's hearing this, has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And if it wasn't for the mercy, the forgiveness, compassion, pardon of Jesus on the cross, you would not know Him. You would not know the Father. You would not be headed to His kingdom with Him. So when are we going to stop being on our high horse and remember who we are, that we ourselves have been forgiven of all things? Anything we've said and done, we have been forgiven of, and when we remember that, it will make it far easier for us than to forgive someone else. R.G. RVG Tasker, in his commentary, Gospel According to Matthew, wrote this, The single-minded who are free from the tyranny of the double-minded. Think about that. When we are single-minded in the, in the fact of what we want to do, then we can finish a goal. It's sort of like that whole, I walk out to my garage with the sole intent of getting a screwdriver. And then I get to my garage and realize, boy, if I pick up all this other stuff, I'll be able to find the screwdriver easier. So the next hour is spent putting things away that has been thrown around and left out. And then I walk back in the house with complete, utter frustration going, I went out there for one simple thing and I didn't come back in with it. I became uh, double-minded, triple-minded. I, I got lost in my thought. When we keep our eyes focused on Jesus, we will be single-minded. When we remember what Jesus did for us, we will be single-minded. When we become double-minded, when we begin looking at the world and what it has to, has to say, the world tells us, curse that person if they hurt you. Be mad at them. Be angry. Don't forgive them. Get back at them. Revenge is sweet, right? But Jesus does not say that here. He says, be merciful because you yourself have received mercy. Sorhen Kierkegaard, a Danish theologian, put down purity of heart is the one is to will one will. Let me read that again. I'm sorry, I messed that up a little bit. Purity of heart is to will one will. What is on your heart right now to will? What is the one thing that you want to do in your life? And if, it is, if your first thing to come up is your first thing that you want to do is to get rich and famous, to have lots of stuff, and you call yourself a Christian, then you have priorities that are not necessarily in place. The next beatitude that we are going to talk about is blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Pure. If we think about the definition of pure, it is uh, unmixed with alloy. It is with or without alloy. It is Pure. I want you to think about if you've ever went to a jewelry store. Uh, I can remember when we bought Denise's engagement ring, and you know, of course, they they look at everybody like, oh, this guy is going to put out some big bucks, right? Well, we'll bring these diamonds that are ninety nine point nine percent pure because you can, you know, if you have that little thingy on your glass glasses and you could look through it you could see all how pure it is and I, i'm the older i get especially the the blinder i get i can't look at anything unless it's a clear piece of glass on a window that that shows me the purity of anything they try to get you because they know that people want that, that that's the way to go that you need to be pure but unfortunately in most of those things unless you are a gem cutter or something and you can really see you're not going to notice the purity of it and they're going to get you for a whole lot of money but it is pure it is the most crystal pure beautiful diamonds you can get gold when you go to buy gold they say you know it's 99 percent pure a lot of times you'll see that uh, the commercials to buy the coins that are 99 percent pure why because they're an increase in value when we are pure in heart, when our, when our heart has been refined, how do they refine gold? They refine it by fire. 
when we have been refined th- uh, through fire, through challenges in our life, and we can remain pure, we will see God. John 1, 8, um, I'm sorry, 1 John chapter 3, 1 through 8 says this. See how great a love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we would be called children of God. I want you to just stop right there because I want you to just bask in that. How great the love the Father has bestowed upon us that we will be called children of God. Children of God. And for such... For this reason, the world does not know us because it did not know him. Beloved, we are children of God and it has not appeared as of yet that we will be. uh, We know that when he appears, we will be like him because we will see him just as he is pure. And everyone who has his hope fixed on him purifies himself. Just as he is pure, everyone who practices sin also practices lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. You know that he appeared in order to take away that sin, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him sins. No one who sins has ever seen him or knows him. Little children, make sure, you, make sure no one deceives you. The one who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. And the one who practices sin is of the devil. For the devil has sinned from the beginning. The Son of God appeared for this purpose, to destroy the works of the devil. Did you hear that? We need to be pure as Jesus is pure. If we are living in the world, if we are living sinful, if we are living according to what uh, the, the devil wants us to do, then we are apart from God. The evil one came here in the very beginning as a serpent in order to, to get the original sin started, and it worked. And every day he continues in our life to be that serpent, that snake, that That one that just finds the gap to mess with us, to make us sin. If we are in God, we are sinless. But if we are in the world, then we are full of sin and we are apart from God. Guys, we need to be pure in heart. We need to refine our heart. You realize that that you can live without anything in your body, your brain, any, anything else, at least for a short time, you cannot live without your heart. Once your heart stops, everything else will die. Why do you think he didn't say purity of the brain? Because the heart will continue to beat. We need to be pure in the beating of our life. We need to be pure in those things that we do and say, the way we act, the way we behave. The things we watch, the things we hear will all be things that we we regurgitate or, or speak out later. If we fill them with worldly things, then we will be as dirty as the world is. When we are refined by fire, when we are pure in heart, when we have been cleansed by the blood of Jesus, then we are according to his will. Purity of heart is to will one will. You cannot serve two masters. Jesus says that... um, In Matthew, you cannot serve two masters. You can't serve me and the evil one. You can't serve uh, what I encourage you to do, what I tell you to do, what I command you to do, and that is to live for me if you are living for someone else. Guys, we need to stop and take a look at our life. We need to stop and take a look at what we're doing. We need to stop and take a look at um, how we're doing it in order to realize if we are working and living for the king or we are working and living to oppose the king. Think about that. Paul was one of the greatest examples we had of that. He spent his enti- uh, the first part of his life just denying Jesus and 
killing Christians. He was on a crusade to kill, kill them all, get rid of this crazy sect. They don't make sense. They're not, they're not real. They're not right. So we'll get rid of them all. And yet, Jesus came to him and said, why are you doing that? And Paul's, Saul's eyes were opened. And his heart was made pure by coming to Jesus. We know that Paul then went on to become a disciple and to learn and just grab all that he could. He gave his life to Jesus. He was baptized and started his ministry. And the next thing we know, he's one of those most prolific speakers we have in the New Testament. To show us, the Gentiles, how to live for Jesus. Guys, the Beatitudes are not something we should take lightly. And I, I, I have often had people call me and say, man, I, I'm struggling. Where should I start in the Bible? And I'd love to say start Matthew 1.1 1, 1, or Genesis 1.1. 1, 1, and I know some of that can be really tough to get through. I generally tell people, read Matthew 5, 6, and 7. The Sermon on the Mount is one of the most powerful things, I believe, and at least for me, that I can read in the Bible. Jesus just lays out the Christian life, and he starts in the very beginning of the Sermon on the Mount with what? Guys, this is how you need to live. This is not a pick and choose. This is not today I want to be pure in heart, and tomorrow I want to be merciful. It is we live our life every day according to to this and then we see the results or those those beautiful things that we'll receive when we are merciful we will receive mercy when we are pure in heart we will see god guys i want you to think about that this week as we go about the the day um i want you to be merciful i want you to be pure in heart it's a, it's a holiday weekend, right? It's a holiday weekend that we can't really do a whole lot. But things are starting to open up again. Families are getting to get back together. It's supposed to be some beautiful weather, probably some great grilling going on. Um, I want you to remember, as you sit down at the dinner table, or you get together with friends, maybe some that aren't Christian, I want you to remember who you are. I want you to remember the, the decision you made at some point in your life to become a follower of Christ. I want you to think tonight or tomorrow or whenever it is, I want you to think of that one person that you cannot forgive. And I want you to pray for that person. I want you to sit down and cry out to Jesus, help me show compassion to that person. As I have received compassion i've been pardoned we hear that often will this president pardon this person or that person jesus pardoned the entire world when we accept him everything we've done every foolish decision we've done every foolish thing we've said every gesture we've made every horrible email that we thought was funny but we sent it out and then we look at it again and go, wow, wow, that does not say Christianity. We have been shown mercy. Guys, this week is the week that we begin to show mercy. This is the week that we begin to be absolutely pure in heart. We don't just need to do it. We have been told we need to do it. Guys, I hope you have a great Memorial Day weekend. I hope you stop sometime throughout this, this wonderful weekend. You stop and just praise God for all our servicemen and women and all those who have paid the price and the families that were left behind. I want you to stop and think about all of our uh, firefighters and, and police officers who have paid the price to keep us safe here on, uh, in, in our, our states, as well as our military who is abroad and here. Guys, I can't stress enough how I just want you to lay the Beatitudes on your heart, and I want you to live them as Jesus calls us to live merciful that we may receive mercy.
Dearest Father, we praise you for your blessings of life and love. We praise you for your blessings of mercy. We certainly don't deserve it. None of us do. And at any time, you could have said, I am not going down there. They don't deserve to be forgiven. But yet, you did not. You took it upon yourself. You took the sins of the world upon your shoulders to forgive that we may become your children. Father, we thank you so much of what Jesus did, the example that he that he showed to us that we may now show mercy, that we may be pure in heart, that we may be meek, that we may be uh, poor in spirit, that we may mourn over our sin, and that we can continue to hunger and thirst for you, hunger and thirst for righteousness. Father, show us the evil in our life that we can shed it off, get rid of it, that we can be pure as Jesus. That someday we will be with you in your kingdom and in your presence. We pray for the Spirit to just fill us, to guide us, to pray for us when we can't but to put heavy in our heart when we haven't spent enough time with you. We praise you, we love you, we thank you, and we offer all this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Hey guys, don't forget, this Wednesday, an adult Bible study starting 6 o'clock Wednesday night in the sanctuary. I'm going to have everything wiped down by then, uh, and we're just going to try to get some uh, normalcy back and get at it. Love you guys, miss you guys, need anything, call the church. Thank you.